This is going to be our third and final conversation about ice machines. This sort of just serves as a recap of what we've talked about in parts one and two. So, again, overview, ice machines are rated in pounds per hour. There's over 30 manufacturers of ice machines. Each has their own unique design features. The ice appearance is part of the design feature. So for manufacturer, isomatic, you have a cube style of small square. Scotsman, shot glasses, crystal tips, buttons, and yo-yos. Just the appearance of the cube. Ross temp, large squares. So that's just an example of some of the differences. There's two main selling points when it comes to ice machines. They're purity and clarity. How pure the ice is with minerals and how clear the ice is. These qualities are achieved by continuous pumping of water over the face of the evaporator, which keeps air from being trapped and keeps suspended solids from adhering to the ice. Most ice machines do not include the minerals in the water in the ice. That's what makes it so clear and pure. This differs from home refrigeration cubes where water does not move and air bubbles can cause cloudy cubes along with unpleasant smell and taste because of the minerals in the water. For ice machine systems, each manufacturer produces one of two types of ice, cubed or flaked. So for the cuber water circuit, all cubers circulate water over the face of an evaporator using a water pump. The temperature of the evaporator is below freezing. Some of the water turns into ice and remains on the evaporator surface. The rest falls back into the sump where it is recirculated back to the evaporator. The water pump is in constant operation while the ice is being formed. Plastic or Tigon tubing carries the water over the entire face of the evaporator. A means of distributing the water over the face of the evaporator is required. A lot of times it might be a stationary spread bar at the top with holes over each portion of the evaporator. It could be an oscillating bar, a bar that swings in circles, spraying the water. It could be a rotating or agitating bar, and they all have small diameter holes. So this is just an example. You have your water manifold at the top. Water flows by gravity over the plate of the evaporator and comes back into the reservoir and then gets recirculated up. This cam right here, this sensor, is my thickness sensor. Once the ice reaches a certain thickness, it's gonna go into harvest mode. The types of harvest are hot gas, hot water bath, and electric. Hot gas is by far the most common and the most efficient. It's initiated by the refrigeration pressure, okay, we know that as ice forms, the pressure will drop. We can initiate it by temperature, or we can initiate it by a probe switch or timer cam. A fixed number of cubes is made during each cycle. In other words, depending on the plate of the evaporator, we could be making 60 or 120 cubes or more. Most cubers drain the remaining water via the sump at the end of each cube bath. Remaining water consists of the suspended solids and impurities. Water is drained and new water replaces it. If this is not done, mineral content will build up and clog water passages. Most machines will have a mechanism for draining impurities at the end of each cube bath. For example, crystal tip dumps and flushes the entire system. Most cubers will also cycle off during the circulating pump during harvest cycle. Flakers are more limited to design. The drum is submerged in water. The inside of the drum acts as the evaporator. A film of ice forms on its surface and the film is continuously scraped by an auger. Ice is pushed or compressed out of the end of the drum by the auger. Ice then falls into the bin. This machine runs constantly in a freeze cycle. There's no harvest cycle until the bin thermostat opens. So this is an example of a flake machine. Okay, the motor drives the gears, which drives the auger. There's water that's constantly coming into this drum, and it pushes the shaved ice out of the top into the bin. This is a storage bin. We always have a drain at the bottom of the storage bin because ice does melt. 
For the Flaker water circuit, Flaker is held in the reservoir above the drum. A float valve mechanism maintains the water level in the reservoir, and water flows by gravity to the lowest portion of the drum. The auger turns at approximately 25 revolutions per minute inside the drum. Again, this is done with a motor and a reduction gear coupled to the end of the shaft. The auger picks up the water while turning, and the water is dispersed over the inside face of the drum and very quickly turns to ice. As the auger turns, it scrapes the ice off the inside of the drum, and the shape of the auger lobs carry the ice to the upper portion of the drum. Ice is then compressed through a small opening where it's directed down a chute and into a bin. As the float in the reservoir drops, the water level is made up through fresh water. Now, when we're dealing with flaker ice, ice is cloudy, it's not clear. It can have traces of discoloration, it can have odors, and depending on your inside, how your water quality is, it could have a bad taste. These traits are associated with the condition of the supply water and the rate of water movement through the evaporator. Solids remain suspended and air is trapped. For these reasons, filters and softeners are often used in the water supply lines of flaked ice that is used in drinks. All ice machines have three circuits. You have a refrigeration circuit, you have a water circuit, and you have an electrical circuit. The refrigeration circuit is the same as most other systems. The major differences are the shape of the evaporator determines the shape of the cubes. You could have flat plate, inclined, inclined or tilted. You could have upside down cubes, which we call shot glasses. You could have cylinder shaped and you have again embossed spots. Ice machines use a standard condensing unit that you would find on other low temperature systems. Flow controls could be TXV, cap tubes, or AXV, and those you find in flakers only because those are a constant, more of a constant load. Low side pressures generally correspond to a 15 to 20 degree evaporator temperature. When the water is warm, the pressures are high. As ice builds up, the pressures gradually drop into a design range. That's a, for R12, it will be about five degrees. Use your chart to figure out what about the five degrees would be. Okay, for other refrigerants. Setting of the superheat should only be done when the ice has begun to form on the evaporator. Harvest cycles are short, five to 10 minutes. Freeze cycles can be as long as an hour for large capacity systems or 20 to 30 minutes for small capacity. Refrigerants are slowly changing. So you really have to look at the labels and figure out what the machine you're working on has for refrigerant. For most older machines, and you'll need to use a drop-in replacement, it's R12. R502 is used in high-capacity machines. R22 is used in some split and newer machines. And we are starting to see R134A used in most of the machines being manufactured now with the exception of the high-capacity. So again, this was a recap more of what you're going to see in the field for ice makers. Two key service points I want to point out on ice makers. First of all, know what refrigerant you're dealing with. And second of all, do not put your gauges on these systems unless you absolutely need to. The amount of refrigerant contained in them is an exact charge. In other words, the amount in your gauge hoses could cause the ice machine to work or to not work in the, in the manner it was designed. So just be really cautious. If you're able to use stub gauges or gauges with very, very short hoses, use those instead of your standard gauge set.